So what happens to these Sevian triangles if now I'm going to dislocate P from this outer uh, circumcircle to the inner one? So I can do this in a couple of ways. I can say, all right, let's just illustrate what's happening. As I move P inwards and I land on that inner circle and I can even trespass it. We're going to explore this on an upcoming video. But now we're actually just want to explore what happens when P is exactly on the inner circle. And uh, as I move my triangles around, even the concept of a Sevian is now easier to understand because the Sevian is going to be uh, correctly inscribed into my reference uh, triangle. And this is the normal way for one to think of Sevian triangles. This is the first way one thinks of Sevian triangles as triangles which are inscribed to a reference one. Of course, we saw a harder case to actually, uh, at least at a first sight, imagine when P is outside, my Sevian now is hanging off of the triangle. Still a Sevian triangle, it's still the same kind of a projective construction. But now let's consider the case when these triangles are constructed with respect to a P that lies inside of my, um, not that lies inside in the interior, but lies on that in circle, right? So I can now uh, move P around and I can investigate what this family is doing and I can ask the same types of questions. What's happening to uh, the locus of some of these triangle centers of the city? Just to remind you of a very obvious fact, all the triangle centers of my family of uh, equilaterals lie uh, at the center, right? Because this is a degenerate triangle family, collaterals, triangle centers are going to be degenerate as well. So not as interesting. Okay, so let's go ahead and start lighting up. Let's take off these construction lines. Let me scale this up some more. Uh, I think that this is uh, already obvious. Let's start lighting up, for example, uh, a particular triangle center such as the in center. So here's the in center of the Sevian and I can play the same game as I uh, jog through my uh, my family of rotating equilaterals x1 is going to be describing a locus okay and I can play the same game and try to see if this locus is anything interesting. It's uh, turned out to be a pretty small object here and looks like it's still uh, an interesting, if you will, uh, as I move P around, an interest, un, non-interesting, uninteresting kind of oval. X1, we never expect for it to be very harmonious in any way. So we can actually skip over X1 and let's go straight to X2 and see what happens to X2. And let's go ahead and reestablish a reasonable amount of scaling here. And now my detector, which I think is reliable, actually I'm pretty sure it is, because I've played with this before, it's actually telling me that X2 is sweeping an ellipse. And it's telling me now that, again, looks like we have an inherent associated object here. This is an ellipse, whose my, so it's tangent to, to the in circle at P, right? So if I move P around, you're going to see that this locus remains an ellipse. The semi-axis of the ellipse are invariant over motions of P. As one would expect, everything is rotationally symmetric. But its minor axis now is one-tenth of the circumradius. And its major axis is some number which we would have to develop some algebra, an algebraic expression for. Again, very similar to the phenomenon we got for x6. Let's just recap that. When I was in the outer, right? If I were in the outer, uh, conic and I played around x6. Recall that x6 was also the, one of these inherent ellipses with minor semi-axis equal to 0.1 and major semi-axis equal to 0.22. Okay, if I now switch to uh, my, I switch p to the inner conic, I'm getting this phenomenon strangely with uh, X2, where I'm getting this sort of conic where one of the semi-axes is, uh, uh, is, um, is one tenth of the circumradius. Why is that? No idea. Probably a good algebraic calculation might reveal why that is. What is the connection between X2 and X6? We know they are an isogonal pair. 
is a sort of isogonality transformation being computed by the Sivian triangle? These are fair questions. In fact, is this 0.1154, so this times 2 is something like 0.23, right? Is that the same number I was getting uh, for x6 in the outer? 0.223, right? So x2 in the inner is 0.11. So this is not going to be 0.223. This is going to be something like 0.23. So I thought that this could have been twice the value that I got for the major axis on x6, but it's not. It's pretty close. Okay, so that's what we get for x2. And we can immediately ask the question, is this preserved over an affine transformation? Now, I think it will be, even though I don't remember what the result was, because again, x2 and Sivians are projectively invariant, and so are uh, conics, right? So as I now get away from that, we're going to see here that x2 remains as we expected, in this case, a conic locus, right? As I move three around, uh, the triangle around, I'm uh, verifying that x2 does not uh, suffer any distortions in the sense that it remains a, the locus remains a conic even post a fine transformation. Okay, how about x3? Now, uh, I actually examined this before and I don't have a good parabola detector up here. But this looks to me, and I'm going to conjecture that this is the case, that this object here, this locus of x3, is actually a parabola whose focus is the center. Well, that's a very interesting result. So I have x3 moving as a parabola, which is now not stably detectable via my conic uh, detector, my least squares conic detector. I should develop something that detects parabolas explicitly. As you know, uh, parabolas are degenerate conics, and if you try to represent a conic with that five-parameter uh, quadratic equation, uh, you end up getting some uh, some degeneracies. Uh, you have like P2 minus 4AC. One of the determinants goes to zero, and that means that you have one last degree of freedom. Parabolas are just, they live in a four-dimensional space, not in a fifth-dimensional space. So in any case, you have to develop something custom for parabolas. But visually, this looks pretty close to a parabola, and this looks pretty close to the focus. I'm going to say that this is what we're getting here. Uh, does this thing survive a fine transformations? Doesn't look like it. You can see here that I'm getting enormous asymmetries already. Um, does not look like this is going to survive. Um, it's not going to survive. The, this thing is not going to remain a conic post a fine transformation, but it looks like a beautiful parabola uh, at this particular uh, state here. Okay, how about x4? Now recall that when p were was outside, x4 had this really strange property of being stationary at the center, right? And we saw that when we actually applied a fine, x4 exploded. Now let's go ahead and now move p to the inner, uh, to the inner circle, and let's get the triangle out of this place. And now we're looking at this shape here. Not sure if this is a parabola. Okay, but it does look like one. So it could be that this is a parabola. Okay, it's certainly not a closed uh, conic. Uh, I'm not detecting this guy as a conic, so I would guess that this thing is a parabola. And just like X3, I don't expect this thing to retain uh, its parabola shape, although it does look like it is, right? So we'd have to actually investigate this better to see if x4 can actually retain being a parabolic curve even upon an application of an affine transformation. How about x5? Um, so let's take away our uh, affine transformation. Let's move to x5. It looks pseudo-parabolic, but it looks like it loses. Like x3, it's losing... It's symmetry, right, as I apply the affine. Whereas, very strangely, and perhaps very interestingly, X4 does not look like it's losing its parabolic symmetry as I apply the affine, just visually. Um, all right, how about X6? Now, this is interesting, right, because X6 
is an oval when let's uh, position P inwardly P is over here X6 looks like an oval it's not being detected as an ellipse and it's an oval even in the simplest case where you're talking about a family of equilaterals so of course if I apply if I apply some affine transformation X6 becomes a complicated curve and uh, don't expect anything to be uh, working out with X7, X8, X9, X10, or X11. X11 is always the, the artist, right? So you can see here that it's producing a pretty neat locus with seemingly a cusp at P. Uh, okay. And then X12, also we don't expect anything. But oh, X12 at the equilateral case seems to be a nice uh, two-petal flower. Okay. All right. Now we get to X13, and recall that X13 was that interesting thing on the outer, on the outer case. X13 was a stationary point, right? When P was outer. Now if I bring P inward, what is X13? X13 now is an uninteresting oval. Uninteresting. We could say this is interesting because it seems to be radial, and it seems like it's upper, and is a, a tangent to to the outer circle. You can see here that as I vary P, you get this kind of phenomenon. Now what happens if I apply some affine? It becomes more distorted. And you would expect the same thing to be happening to X14, although this looks quite circular. But it's not telling me this thing is even a conic. So the detector is saying this is not a conic, which, you know, if I were just eyeballing this, I would say this is a conic. But I would actually trust this detector because it does a pretty good job detecting conics. So if it's, if it's telling us this is not, you can trust it. Uh, as I apply a transformation, this thing is no, not a conic either. So it doesn't start as a conic and does not continue as a conic. How about X15, which was a circle in the outer case? Now we have, uh, you know, in the equilateral case, we have the sort of oval passing through the origin. Uh, X16 was also interesting before, but it's no longer interesting here. It's a parasitic kind of thing attached uh, to my, my circle. It looks like an amoeba, right? Uh, and as I apply an affine transformation, it becomes a more complicated curve. So we didn't get a lot of interesting phenomena here. In the next video, I'm going to explore what happens to some of these shapes as we smoothly transition from outer P into inner P.